Welcome, everyone. I'm standing on this stage because we are live streaming this. So normally, I would be down in front of you. So you're going to have to all forgive the fact that we're kind of formal tonight, but we have this opportunity to have audiences from across the country join us. So welcome if you're joining us through the live stream. My name is Christine Beamer, and I'm the Director of Career Services and Music Entrepreneurship for the College of Music. And I am so excited to welcome our alum, Christian Habel, to the stage today. Um, I don't know if all of you had a chance to read his bio, but Christian has had a really wonderful, multifaceted career from playing Concertmaster on Broadway with Wicked, to touring with Barbra Streisand and George Benson, to performing with Rihanna and Carrie Underwood and a variety of styles. And then he's also been a recording artist in Hollywood for a ton of movies from Deadpool to The Life of Pi to X-Men, and I'll let him tell you more about that. Um, but just as we welcome him to the stage so that he can get a sense of who you are, um, can you raise your hand if you are a string player? Awesome. How about wind players? Brass players? Composers? Yeah. Uh, vocalists. Any vocalists? Awesome. Um, who did I piano? Any piano? Yes, we've got a pianist. Awesome. Um, will you please join me in welcoming to the stage Christian Habel? Yeah, so um, I'm going to stay up here for just a second while okay. you, you get to take I, a seat. <laughs> you mind if I sit, everyone? A little more comfortable. Um, so I was hoping that you would just start us out by giving us a sense of in your daily life on a say monthly basis, what are the kind of things you do for work? For work, uh, um, my line of work, it's, it's fun for me because it's always different week to week and day to day. Um, I live between New York and LA, but right the, the last year has been mostly in Los Angeles. Um, so a day-to-day -day there or a month in Los Angeles will be, um, I have six TV shows that I play on every week, um, and that might be just one session a week or one session every other week, depending on the TV show, um, different movies every week, and never know kind of what it is until I get in there, so that's fun. Um, it's all sight reading based, uh, that you'll, you know, you get the music take it one take, maybe two takes, the, the composer might change a little bit, um, and then you'll move on. Um, I tour with several of the artists I play with um, that are pretty much rock, pop, and hip hop artists, different artists, so when they're on tour, I'll go with them, or when they're in the recording studio, I'll record with them. Um, in Los Angeles, it's not as many commercials or jingles as I, I do in New York. New York would be, um, a month there would be Broadway show, so it's eight shows a week of whatever Broadway show I'm playing, um, and then recording commercials or jingles at night or during the day. Um, and when I'm on tour, it's, it's depending on the artist. I was just with um, Barbara Streisand, so we had, a, we had a show in London for 75,000 people in Hyde Park outside, and, um, and Barbara doesn't tour that much, so we have a nine-piece band. Um, so we had that show uh, a week and a half later. We had Madison Square Garden show, and then four days after that, at the United Center in Chicago. And that was and that was it. Um, and, and maybe you know we'll have a few more concerts with her in two or three months. It all depends on her, her her wanting to do it or her schedule. If I'm with other artists, we might have you know seven five five to seven shows a week. Um, if it's a rock band or if it's um, Beyonce or Rihanna or whoever, you know, they want to put as many shows as possible in. Um, but that's kind of the given, yeah, day to day as a, as a, I call myself a studio musician sometimes if I'm doing that or a tour musician or a session musician. Um, so it all depends. And can you tell us a little bit about how you got from MSU and college to that life as a studio musician, as a session musician, as a pit musician? Absolutely. So while I was, un I did undergraduate here in, in at Michigan State. Um, I grew up in Plymouth, which was kind of between Ann Arbor and Detroit, Plymouth, Michigan. Um, and for me, when I was in high school, I was taking classes 
um, in Ann Arbor at University of Michigan or downtown Detroit. So for me, getting away from home was coming to Michigan State because it was like two hours away. Um, I knew I didn't want to go right from high school to New York or LA, but I knew in my heart, you know, I wanted to spend time for sure in New York. Um, so coming here was a great opportunity just for me to get an education and learn to be a classical musician, but then also while I was here taking, um, having jazz combo and taking jazz lessons and really getting into the non-classical scene. So that's, for me, what Michigan State allowed me to do is see the other realms of music and the other genres of music um, that I was really passionate about and wasn't sure that there was a career in that, um, but knew I wanted to try to make it in that. Um, and, and for me as a, as a classical violinist, there, there weren't the role models that I was looking at in the real world doing what, um, doing what I wanted to do, which was I wanted to be on stage, um, I wanted to improvise, I wanted to play you know, rock, I wanted to play jazz, I wanted to play all different styles. And there was no one, there were no violinists that I could look to to see that. There were the best classical soloists, there was the best, you know, jazz, saxophonist, trumpets, you know, every other instrument in those genres, but not a violinist who was doing all of that. So that was kind of something I had to create on my own. Um, while I was here, um, I was studying with a number of jazz faculty as well as my classical private violin instructor. Um, and doing orchestra and, and all the, you know, the core curriculum classes. But in, in overtime, you know, I was in the practice room shedding bluegrass solos or saxophone, you know, and, and uh, trumpet licks and, and solos of, of artists, you know, that I looked up to. Um, so I was doing that in addition and trying to still see what, what, which way I wanted to go. Still knowing, at that point, I added Nashville to the mix to where Maybe you know I was I was I saw these fiddlers and bands on stage and touring around. Not that I enjoyed listening to country music, but I was like, oh, there's a violinist who's on stage with a you know a singer and, and improvising. So it was Nashville, New York, and LA. I knew between those three, I wanted to go after school. And while I was here, I got a job in Lansing Symphony um, as the second chair violinist, associate concertmaster, and it allowed me to see that that wasn't a career I really wanted to do. Like, you know, one of my aspirations was maybe being a major symphony orchestra. Um, and I knew what it was gonna take, learning the excerpts, I knew what it was gonna take for the auditions. I had friends that were in the orchestras and, and Lansing got, gave me a, the, the full-time position there gave me a kind of a, a um, view and, and a feeling that, you know, I didn't wanna do this the rest of my life playing a symphony, I wanted to make my own path and be more creative musically. Um, so that was a great opportunity. And the second opportunity from that was any of the Broadway shows or rock bands or singers that came to town, if they needed a violinist, they would ask the concertmaster and the concertmaster didn't want to take those jobs because he was strictly a classical player. So they would offer to me and that's, that's how I started um, getting these you know, Broadway shows and sitting in the pit, which was new to me. Um, and playing on stage with a singer and you know, a five piece band of which they, their violinist couldn't make it. And I was you know, reading charts and improvising and, and I loved it. And I was making connections also with those music directors and those performers and those singers that were saying, oh, you need to, you know, you need to get to New York. Uh, they were all saying that, no, nothing LA based. Um, so I was like, yeah, I've got to get to New York. You know, I've got to do this. And it was also opening my eye to like, me realizing I'm good at this. Um, I'm good at improvising. I'm good at playing different styles. Um, and that really set in motion my passion for wanting to be diverse and playing all those different genres. Um, and I'd always had the dream of playing on Broadway. I always had the dream of playing in movies and TV shows. Um, so getting to New York, I was like, this is gonna be my goal, like getting a Broadway show. Um, so I used grad school to get out there, um, and it, it really helped. It wasn't just me going there and trying to make it on my own and, and you know, having, having to get some other job to make it as a musician right off the bat. I went for the schooling and to get my grad and, and knew 
Um, I had a two-year program, and during that time, I was actively following up on the connections I made um, of those tours that came through to the Wharton Center when I was playing with them, um, or on this stage, or the auditorium, wherever. And it was, it was leading to me going and being able to sit in with them or watch them work or sit in a Broadway pit um, or sit in the club and watch you know, these, these bands really do real life work. Um, so that was amazing and that started me getting more work while I was in grad school and it um, I really kind of crossed over to where I was doing both to where when I got out of school um, I was already working in the scene which was which was great and I loved it. Um, but that was, yeah, getting to New York. And then I, then I slowly started doing both New York and LA where I'd go back and forth and do studio recording in, in LA during the week and then I'd um, play Broadway shows when I'd be in New York over the weekends. Great, thanks. Um, I wanna open it up to the questions you all have. Because we are live streaming this, I know that none of us need this mic. We're all musicians, we project well. But because the live stream audience won't be able to hear us, um, if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. So, anyone have a question? Hi, Christian. Uh, so for everybody in the audience, uh, Christian and I were talking before. Um, I have some students here in uh, a uh, music, uh, a form of a music business class that I teach here at MSU. Um, and actually today, uh, one of the things that we talked about uh, at some length, um, because it's early in the course, uh, we're figuring out a little bit about what it means to take uh, our training as classical musicians. Um, and uh, you have that as well, of course. And somehow, in a self-managed way, right, turn that into something that we can make money doing. And uh, for you, as you've, as you've wonderfully described, that is this uh, really um, awesome, amazing career doing more commercial style music or music that appears, all, all this kind of stuff. And it may be something where you use your training all the time, but you're not really playing quote unquote classical music all the time anymore, right? So I was just wondering um, for you what the experience was like of you uh, growing up and learning a really um, craftful job of playing classical music, but then kind of moving into doing something where you now, uh, you play your violin like constantly, but you still look out at other people who do classical music in a more traditional way, right? So what has that journey been like for you to turn um, your training as a classical musician, musician and all this craft that you have into something a little bit different that you now make a living doing? And have you, did you ever feel um, like you were abandoning your training? Did you ever feel um, like you were had to give anything up in order to do this? And how did you kind of avoid having to go through that? Yeah, it's a great question. So. So it was coming from, as you know from anyone coming from the classical world, um, it is changing and doing something non-classical sometimes is looked differently on. Same way uh, for jazz musicians. Jazz musicians, you know, playing outside that genre is a lot of times, um, you know, called selling out or, or you know, it's, diff it's, it's, a, it's a different concept. Um, we don't come, in the classical world, we don't come from a community that's, very eager to, to want you to do other genres. Um, so the classical training is obviously what gave me my technical ability, how I learned. I couldn't do what I'm doing now without the classical training. Um, that being said, I do, like you said, I do look at, you know, for the, um, the classical colleagues that are, that are soloing or playing in orchestras um, with great honor that they're doing that, and I respect that so much. Um, but just know that, that I'm comfortable not doing that right now. The, the classical training, as far as where it's gotten me now, is that um, it's, it's, I've had to use that to kind of be creative in both an entrepreneurial and kind of um, money-making ability at different times. Because in between a Broadway show or in between tours early on, I would have to come up with concepts to make money or make it in New York City um, that were not non-musical jobs. I mean, there were times where I was bartending, um, but 
for one instance, it was like literally with friends forming a quartet and for the sole basis of, um, this was early on with like Spotify and streaming services, um, to, to create that niche of wedding, wedding music for that, that was not live quartet. So we formed this quartet. We were doing a lot of high-end weddings and, and, and parties in New York City, but at the same time, um, going to different halls and recording strictly music that would usually be asked or considered for weddings. And sure enough, that was, you know, at the time it was like the top streaming and downloaded from iTunes or from Spotify. So people were, unfortunately, you know, as we knew they were using recordings at some weddings around the world, but they were using ours and we were getting revenue streams out of it. So it was kind of, you know, it was very creative at the time. Now you look and there's, you know, tons of it. Um, but at that time, and even using what we were using, like at the time I was playing with Billy Joel, so we used that in the, in the bio, and, and someone else was with, um, uh, it wasn't, I think it was Placido Domingo, or, or Jose, you know, one of the op, hopper singers at the time. So we were getting all these different um, a, attention brought to it from the classical world, and the pop world, and the rock world, just from people like, oh, this is a, this is a string quartet that, you know, plays for famous people. And, what we thought worked um, because people were using that. And at the same time, locally in the New York and Connecticut and New Jersey, um, we were getting weddings that if we were not working, we could take. Um, so that was using our classical background, even though none of us at that time were really working in the classical world. Um, we used that to, you know, to, to make some income at the time. Um, now there's even more diverse ways you can, you can do that with social media and with sponsorships. Um, you know, I've, I've learned that with, with social media with different, just musical companies alone, with violin case companies or microphone companies that, that will give you product and will have you use product just to share while you're on tour or on Instagram and they'll, you know, either pay you money or they'll give you, you know, all the product you want. So it's really interesting that there's, that there's other realms out there that we're not really, you know, I wasn't taught about in school um, and have had to figure that out. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> Another question? Yes? Thank you for waiting so long. <laughs> um, so you touched upon like how like when you were like in that big concert, like orchestra or so, you were given those opportunities to do these outside of classical like gigs and stuff like that because the person running it wasn't like very apt with it and didn't want to like give up any people for that. But like since you were interested, they like directed it towards you. On that, do you think it's more important for like directors to be more open so everyone gets those kinds of opportunities? So like, would it be like better for students to know all of their available options rather than to just like not be aware of everything because it's not told to them or like not like given or shown as like an opportunity they should have? That's a great question. So I I thoroughly agree. It's a it's a personal choice because I you know as much as I love playing all genres, and if there's a, if I find out a new genre, um, you know, of South American music or African music, like I literally want to listen to it as much as I can and try to emulate it. Whether I can, you know, master it is another possibility, but that's, that's in me. I want to be able to play every different genre on the violin. But I've, you know, worked with a lot of people that it, it's, it's not for them. It, it's, it's not that they wouldn't be able to do it, but it's just, it's not something they would enjoy. So to answer your question, I, I, I don't think it's necessary for every musician or someone in the music community to, to be diverse. Do I think it's helpful? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's helpful in um, getting work. It's, it's helpful in opening up your community of musicians and of friends. It's, it's uh, opening up the possibility of work 10 years later that you can call on these people and, you know, that absolutely. But I, I don't think it's necessary because there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of classical string players that it's just not for them. They would never enjoy it. They wouldn't be good at it necessarily. And it would, in order to, you know, master and use it in their everyday life, 
we don't have the, it wouldn't have the time to do that, you know, because they're, they want to be a, a chamber musician or they want to be a, a, in a symphony. So in that kind of respect, it would, it would take away from what their goal is. Um, but at the same time, I think it's, I think it's an invaluable thing that, you know, if, it, if it's something in you and, and you, you see that you could follow that, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a big proponent on leaving options wide open and being diverse. And that even if you have a path to being in a symphony orchestra, why not be diverse if you can so you have these other um, avenues to go on? But it's, it isn't, it's not necessarily for, for every person. There was a time in my life where I thought, oh, every musician, you need to be able to play every genre and appreciate every genre. I don't, I don't think that's true anymore. Um, there's genres of music that I, would, I don't enjoy listening to, but I see the benefits and I can pick out intricacies and you know, technicality of a musician or, or, or things within the music. Um, but I don't necessarily think you have to love listening to it or appreciate it. So that was things that changed within me um, the same way of like, does everyone have to be diverse? I don't necessarily think so, but it, it's a huge plus, I think in the world that we're living in now, um, how music's going and with social media and with every, every thing that the music's taking on in the world. It can't, you know, it can only help you to be diverse and, and, and um, dabble in different genres, I think. Yeah. So when you're thinking about like um, New York as like a recording city, or Nashville, or LA, or wherever it happens to be. As a recording scene, you said? Yes, as a, just like a place in which you can, um, there are a lot of those studios and a lot of places where people will go to find those jobs. Do you generally find that that's the same group of people who are, uh, who have those jobs? Does that rotate a lot? Are there uh, new people who break into those markets? If not, um, are there niche mar or yeah, niche markets outside of those cities where you can go to find that type of work. Okay, so, so within those cities, um, just between LA and Nashville and, and New York, say, um, for, the, for the session musicians in LA for the movies, there is a core, I would say, 90 musicians um, in LA, even, you know, the, the the union there has thousands and, and people that are, there's even more that aren't in the union. But of the core musicians that are playing these movies and TV shows, um, 90, maybe 95 musicians. And we'll get, whether it's a, an 80 piece orchestra for the call or a 10 piece ensemble or a 20 piece ensemble, it's from those core players. There's another maybe 100 that are on call shall I say, for the, for the contractor. The contractor is the person that's calling for the sessions in LA or for the, for the commercials. It's different in New York and Nashville, but in LA, there's a contractor that's, that the composer works with hiring those mu musicians. Um, and that's kind of the core. It's, it's, it's tough to break in. Um, and it used to be to where there were um, just under 300 core musicians playing when they had more studios. You mentioned also like in New York where the studios are, the studios themselves are um, being closed down just for a lack of work in New York and LA unfortunately. When I got to LA, when I started working there in 2006, um, the two biggest studios that we would work at are no longer there. Paramount and Todd AO and now there's um, three big sound stages as opposed to five. And then you also, you still have Capitol Records and East West Sound and United kind of for more pop music um, and rock and hip hop. But it's, it's scaled down to where the, the, the recording's gone outside of LA um, because it's gone non-union and it's gone to London, Vancouver, Seattle, and then Eastern Europe. Um, so that core of when I first started has gone even smaller. Um, New York even, even more so that the big studios have closed down, unfortunately. Um, 
and the Broadway show musicians where it used to be a core of you know, several hundred is, is closed down too because each theater is using less and less musicians in their Broadway shows. Um, so that's a, you know, a really downside for us. Um, Tour Wicked is the last of the, that was the last of the you know, 27 piece orchestra pit musicians where you used to have 30 to 40. Um, most of the old, old time My Fair Lady in Oklahoma was all 30 to 40 piece orchestration. So Wicked being 27, now it, if Wicked closed and something else went in there, it would be 15 musicians. And it's just, you know, they're, they're, the producers are going smaller and smaller and, and putting the musicians away so the audience doesn't see them, literally. Like pits are covered now to where you used to see the musicians' heads. Um, so as far, as far as that, you know, the older musicians are, are holding jobs um, and the jobs are dwindling down to where um, the pool is getting smaller and smaller. Um, Nashville is actually kind of expanding in that way, but, but they're moving a lot of recording there, non-country as well, so it's more than just country and bluegrass. But um, yeah, it's a lot of home studios um, and things of that. Is, is that an answer to your question on that? Okay. I like the mic traveling around. <laughs> Thanks for being here, you guys. Yes. Hi. Um, so you've managed to accomplish your original goal, which was to perform on stage and to maybe be a recording artist. And I feel like you're really living the dream, which is amazing. But do you still have goals for yourself that you'd like to accomplish yet? Are there things in your life that you feel like you've musically have not had the opportunity to do? And if so, what are they? Yeah, thanks for asking that. It's, I still do. I, I, I always, from starting at Michigan State, I, I, had these, I made these goals because I knew if I have goals, I'm gonna accomplish them. Or you know, being kind of trying to be confident on that level, um, as opposed to if I have goals, I'm gonna try my best to accomplish them. So it was, it was the, the playing in movies, TV, playing in Broadway, and, and going on stage. It, it, those were the first ones. Going on stage and touring with, with, you know, my rock icons that I that I grew up idolizing. That was a dream I, I added on, uh, later, and that that was something I realized. Oh, I, I've always wanted to do, doing that. Um, things that I haven't accomplished yet, for sure, is, um, I've always wanted to to um, headline shows myself to where other artists have given me, you know, I've opened for them. Um, they've given me intermission kind of thing, like the, the singer Josh Groban, who I was on tour with for years in his band, he'd let me, he'd, he'd take a break during the show and leave and introduce me and I'd, you know, play rock covers or play original stuff I did or, or, or wrote or jazz, you know, just totally diverse things. And I loved that. And my, I was always like one day, I want to do that and have like somebody open for me. I haven't done that yet. Um, I still I still see before I get too old. Um, I could do that. The other is is to put out um, an album of uh, my songwriting, which I just finished um, a few months ago. Not viol. I mean, it's it's like lyrics and songs, and it's of with different different singers singers that I've worked with in the past and, and, and wanted to work with again, um, a different producer on every track, um, and very, very current and very um, um, placeable for like TV or movies. Because I, I, you know, I'm seeing that's another whole genre that I didn't, didn't know much about in school or even through my career is um, the syncability of songs, like once you write them and if you write them correctly for movies or TV, they're placed in the, in the movie or TV, and, and it's you know, very lucrative to get payment for that, plus residuals when they're going. Um, so that's mainly what this album is. Um, there's some violent aspects in it that you know, don't even sound like violin, or it's so phased out, or pizzicato, or whatever, but it's um, mostly lyric-driven hip-hop rock and, and, and pop stuff. So that was something, it, it, whether, whether it ever gets out you know, that's, I'm still working on, but those are my two goals. Yeah, to kind of be on stage doing my own thing 
which is separate from that, playing violin, and then also the songs, getting the songs out. So, yeah, thanks for asking that. We had a question come in on the live stream, yeah. um, which was, do you, given how much um, you juggle between different genres, how do you make decisions on what to take, and how do you juggle it all? How do you find a balance? Oh, that's really interesting. So, uh, so uh, how do I choose what to take? So early on, um, early on when I would get jobs, I would, I would say yes and be so eager and excited and just like, yes, I can do it. I would get to the point where if it was something that I didn't really know how to do, I remember, I remember at Michigan State um, in a jazz combo and it was Andrew Spate was the, was the professor at the time and, and it was Branford Marcellus was here as visiting jazz artists starting and I was taking lessons from him and it was, it was the, he had asked like what string instruments other than the violin you play and I was the only violinist in the jazz program or not program but taking the jazz classes and I said I can play mandolin a little bit he said well do you play banjo and I said I can learn he goes good learn it you know you were putting it together Dixieland combo um, so I literally went to elderly music and got a tenor banjo and like shed it and, and learned and taught myself how to play the chords to where we had a Tixieland combo that you know would play at the hotels around town and again we were making money and that was also and also learning from the professor um, and me saying yes so it was it was in New York and LA too I would say yes to jobs um, not necessarily jobs that I didn't know how to do but if I didn't know how to get there like I would be in New York and I got called to do a movie in LA and they just said you know are you available these three weeks and it was about three weeks off three weeks away um, and I said yes absolutely I didn't say oh I'm in New York you know they just gave me the studio info said where to go um, and it was a it was a Star Trek Returns it was like John Williams music but hit there was a co-writer and um, and I got there I, I got there I stayed with a friend I got from the airport to his place and you know just like made it happen and if I would have thought too much about it I would have been like oh wait where this is in LA I'm in New York and they would have been like okay thank you you know they wouldn't have it, like I, I you know had to think ahead now I'm, I'm a little more picky and choosy about what work it is just because um, I have two young sons I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old um, I'm not going between New York and LA as much um, trying not to at all, taking less tours, um, and just taking my time on saying yes to things. Um, even this, this morning got asked to, like Elton John just finished up his, his last tour, he's retiring, just finished up in California, and they, this show popped up at the Greek Theater, it's a small venue, and I got asked, you know, will I play with him next month? And instead of saying yes, absolutely, you know, I had to say, oh, can I put it on hold? I'll get back to you. You know, that's not, that I wouldn't have done that 10 years ago. I would, I would jump at it and be like, absolutely. But now it's kind of shifted to where instead of saying yes to everything, I'm saying, you know, let me let you know. Um, and figuring out what that week looks like, what that schedule looks like, and then honestly seeing if there's a better job that comes along. I might, I might have a movie call that's two weeks, and if I was playing with Elton, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to do that movie because some movies you have to do every single day. Others you can you can sub out. Um, so that's an interesting it's an interesting question because um, it is really tough to juggle it and choose which jobs to take. Um, it could be an artist I've always wanted to work with, but it you know if it's a six month tour, right now in my life I'm going to say no. Um, you know because I don't want to take it. I've done the six month tours and loved it, but it's like right now it's not the right place for me. Um, so yeah, it, it's depending on where you are in your music career, you're going to be different about choosing work and where it takes you and where, you know, you guys are at a place where, you know, let it take you anywhere in the world, wherever, you know, whether it's a tour or whether it's moving to a certain city because you need to find that, um, niche of that genre, whether it's New York or, or LA or wherever, but um, that'll change, I think, for everybody. Good question, though. Any other questions? 
Hi. Hello. Um, so I had a my first question was going to be about location, but um, after what you've said, I've kind of changed it because it was initially going to be, what would you do if you couldn't have gone to one of the three cities that you've listed? Um, but now, since you've said that, you know, even jobs there are dwindling, um, and that it's a smaller pool, and they're going for less musicians, and the people that would have the jobs have them now already. You know what I mean? Like the the older guard, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, and I think a lot of us are here also because we identify mostly as like just classical musicians uh -huh. and we want to see what all of our other options are. Um, and it might be a little disheartening to hear that all of our other options are going also, you know, <laughs> like all of our other like pop options or whatever that you want to call them, um, you know. It's like the same across the board. So I guess my question is, um, do you see any trends in the industry of like where it's going that's not necessarily like what you're doing now. Um, and the only thing that I could like think of maybe is like something with chamber music, just because um, similarly for what you said, like there is a need for um, wedding quartets. So y'all made one and did it. And it was just a small elite group of friends and y'all found your way that way. And I'm wondering if the same kind of thing would apply to your current um, ordeal. Do you know what I mean? Like recording and all of that. Yeah, I mean, and, and just me saying about the, the studio scene and the, the um, commercial scene kind of dwindling down, I mean, we've, before that, we saw it in the classical community. We saw it in the orchestras, you know, that, that other than in Europe, like where our, our orchestras are kind of dwindling and, and the ones that are there are shorter seasons, um, which is really sad. So it is, like you said, I mean, it's, it's sad that it's across the board. As far as trends, I mean, the way the music scene now is working, it's, it's really changing like every five, six months to where even, you know, we're fighting for legislation in Congress to, you know, we just got something passed where getting um, for songwriters and sidemen and people on albums, you know, it's like we're trying to gain things back, but it's really tough. Um, the trends of where it's going, I, the po one positive thing is that I, th I think there's, for content creation, it's, kind of the wild west right now and taking advantage of that. Um, you know, it, it's where that's gonna go. I think hip hop and pop community has really gotten that down and homeschool producers that are, that are you know, able to do stuff in their home studio and get that out fast are really, you know, gaining traction. But um, small ensembles, I think, I, like you said, I think small ensemble is always gonna be, um, a positive and a, and a money-making situation no matter what city you're in if you can really um, if you're a great ensemble you know how to market yourself um, if you have a, a gimmick that's even better you know if it's if it's not you know a gimmick I mean mixed ensemble or just different you know throw a, a percussionist and upright bass in with a, you know you know any kind of thing and really have some you know, write for some grants for new music or young composers, you know, get that involved. You can do that from anywhere now. You don't have to be in a big city. Um, you, I think, I think there's endless amounts to get your content out there with social media now that ensembles or classical ensembles or quartets still aren't doing, you know, that, that is the future. Um, I, like you said, I think there is a, a, a wave that'll bring kind of small ensembles you know, quote unquote classical or contemporary back in. But um, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, the, the changing music community is really, it's tough everywhere, everywhere in the world, other than where it's government sanctioned, like in Europe, you know, where it's like the government gives money to the arts. We definitely don't do that in this country. Um, yeah, it's like, it's bittersweet. There's, there's new things out there, but there's also, old things that are dwindling, but, um, yeah. There was another question over here? Oh. Hi. 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 Um, <clears throat> my first question was uh, between, like, live music, um, doing stuff in film, and doing stuff in Say the Say that studio. one more time, sorry, I didn't hear. Sorry. Uh, like, between doing, like, live music, stuff for film, and stuff in the studio for music, what would be your favorite? Between live uh, studio 
like studio just music, music and in the studio and then film. And film? Yeah. Um, yeah, the film and studio music, I, I mean, my, my favorite thing is, is live and being on stage. Um, and that can, that's in any realm. I'll, I'll usually I play, you know, classical concerts with a symphony, like soloing some symphony in the world, like once a year, I'll do like a, a few concerts with them. I love that. I love um, improvising with, with um, a pop or rock artist. I think I, I, I much prefer that personally. Um, but then there's not a day in the studio that I'm not exhilarated just because it's new, it's new music being put in front of me and, and putting that down. And that's, and that's something more I can have my family and friends like go and see. Does that make sense? Because I've, I've, I've done shows that I wish my family and friends could have seen that I played live somewhere in the world, um, but they just can't and it's not recorded. Um, but it's funny, I can, ha I can say, oh, go to the movies. <laughs> you know, this weekend and see this movie you can hear me playing on. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a, for me, there's a, there's a thrill to all those. There's a, there's a real thrill to studio musicianship. And, um, and that wasn't something I had at Michigan State until um, moving, moving to New York. I had some, some recording gigs in Detroit um, that I'd go to to play for like some s small artists there, but, um, never really had the thrill of like the studio scene where the lights, all the lights cut out and you just, it's dark and you're watching the movie on the big screen and you're, and the composer's saying, you know, let's, let's crescendo right to that place where that thing blows up or where the kiss comes, you know, we want it to be sweet. It's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's really neat. Sometimes I do get, I get teary. It's kind of fun. Like I, I think, oh my gosh, I'm doing this. Like, I can't believe it. Um, this one is a little unrelated. Um, as far as like with the album that you are creating for um, Sync to Sync, um, you said you like learned a lot. Where would you say you learned a lot, or like if it's if it was more in the industry, like what's some of the key things that you learned? Um, how did I learn to do to to get to that place to do the album? You said or just or? well to because you said that you like specifically kind of made it for Sync licensing. Oh yeah, how did I learn? That was, that was through experience as a musician and being, you know, seeing how the guys, the engineers and the producers in the control room worked, the moments I could go in the control room and, you know, watch the engineers work. Um, and then also just seeing the trends of TV and film and all these streaming services now putting out tons more TV, excuse me, TV shows than we've ever had content out there and, and seeing what kind of music they were using. Um, it's gotten a lot more to electronic and like I was saying, home studio guys that are doing it on synths, but um, just songs that would fit in. That's how, that's how I learned that. And then to, to, you know, be a producer on all the tracks along with um, like a tried and true producer that I had for the tracks. It was just learning from them the same thing. So where I know if I ever, or if I do put that out, I should be confident about it. When I do put it out, I know the next one's going to be easier and I've learned that much more from it. But um, there's just, I, I have always been a believer that there's so much to learn in every environment you're in with music and outside of music, whether you're on a, you know, I'm on the plane on the way here. It's like, if I want it, you know, you sit back and you can learn from the people around you, like what things you do like, what things you don't like, what, you know, it's that kind of thing, which we all can do if we want to, but we don't, but it's specifically in the music world and in our jobs and in our lessons and in the concerts we see, it's like learning from that and pluses and minuses. You know, I'm, I'm a huge critic to where I can't, um, I really can't go to a, a classical concert, like a whole concert anymore. I go to like first half or second half. I just, I, it, you know, it, it's things that I want to do th th musically differently or things that I, you know, I, I'm, I'm nitpicky. Um, but you can do that in, in everything, you know, and I'm, you don't have to always see the positive in things. You can see the negative and learn from that in your own, you know, listen to your own music back um, it's just always learning and always being of service to other people as well. It's like if it's, you can, if there's a professor that you've heard about or a class that you've heard about that you're not a part of, you know, to ask to be, to sit in or be a part of it or ask if you can assist in some project that's going on. Um, you can learn from all that. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in that.
and you get opportunities out of it too. We probably have time for one or two more questions. Okay. Hello. Hi. I just have a quick question that just asks, what were some challenges that you overcame? I know a lot of, um, a lot of the artists or just musicians that we know, they got to where they are because of certain failures, quote unquote, or just things that didn't necessarily go their way but ultimately brought them to where they were now. So whatever it be, what were some challenges that you overcame that were monumental to where you are now in life? That's great. A, a big challenge in moving to New York and realizing the, the music scenes that I wanted to be a part of um, and the jobs I wanted to be a part of, realizing that they were a much, much older crowd. Musicians were much older. Um, that was a huge thing to overcome, kind of personally, because I was like, I didn't f feel I felt f to fit in there, but also from them, you know, kind of judging me that I was young and therefore inexperienced and therefore shouldn't be there. Like in the Broadway community, um, you know, at the time I was the youngest concertmaster, I think that, you know, definitely on Broadway at that time, people had said from before that even, um, like they were literally, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, like guys in, uh, in the pits, like that was their whole life. And a lot of them did look down on me that, that before they even heard my playing. It was just like, oh, he's, he's this young kid, you know, he shouldn't be here. That was a huge obstacle to overcome. Um, that I'm older now, so I haven't felt that in, in Los Angeles so much, you know, because there's, there's guys younger than me now that I'm like, hey, you're, you're too young to be here. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, uh, but that, was a, that was big for me, because it was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should not be in New York right now. Maybe I'm too, you know, and I was, and a lot of the big name jazz clubs I was going to, you know, it's the, the legends with their band, there's all, you know, old guys. I've, I've since, you know, now I'll go to the, the clubs that it's like the young struggling jazz guys that are great, you know, it's like the, the, all the people right out of school playing. But it was, that was a big hurdle for me to overcome, kind of thinking, and even, even the guys that didn't judge me, I was, I was putting that on them, like, oh, I think they're looking at me differently because I'm a kid, um, right, you know, right from, right from Michigan, right from undergraduate. That was a big hurdle for me to overcome. Um, and also, every kind of, at first, when I was trying to break into all the different genres, it was the same kind of thing where they have their community, they have their set amount of players, and they're very, you know, they, they are threatened by new musicians. Because like we were saying, you know, the community's getting smaller. So each of those, whether it's bluegrass or whether it's Jazz in New York, it's, you're, you're always, the new guys always looked at as competition. Um, and I, it's, that's the same, if not more now, um, in, the, in a lot of these cities. So that was, that was really hard for me to overcome too. Um, you know, you just have to, you have to get past it and, you know, just play like hell and then show them how you can, you know, what kind of musician you are. And, um, and gain their respect, and then they're like, oh, you, you know, okay, you can be here. Um, but it's tough. It's tough to have that put on you when it's not something musical. Does that make sense? Like, it's not you going in there and being like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can play this as well as them. It's not that. It's going in there and being ready. Everything's ready. You're ready to perform. And then you have this other, you know, it's like all, all the performance anxieties that we have. And that's just an added thing of like having someone else's judgment on you. If there's, there's, there's always something to overcome in performance that we don't think about. And that help, it helps with nerves, for me at least. It makes me nervous, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do better. I'm gonna try to do better. But um, yeah, I think that's a big, that was a big hurdle to overcome. Anybody have one last question? It doesn't have to be profound.
So you've mentioned uh, a couple times um, your interaction now on social media. Um, and I myself have recently seen how that has kind of developed and how musicians are taking advantage of that platform. But what have you learned from being a musician that's already been established and been playing with major people of how we can, maybe younger students, can help to take advantage of social media and market ourselves? It's funny, the biggest thing and I've, I've said this before in, in lectures and master classes with social media, at least right now, the trend. I use it differently than, like you're saying, someone, someone new breaking onto the scene. Um, I'll use it to promote, even though I haven't, I haven't, I think it's been like four weeks I haven't done anything, but usually I'm good at like what I'm doing or where I'm performing, having a picture with the artist or a video like on stage or showing the genre, the, the venue. Um, and that's kind of, to support the fans of mine on social media, and that's what they want to see. But, but as a new up and coming, this crazy trend of um, practicing and just doing licks is like a huge gaining of followers. Um, a lot of people I've, I've told, and they've, you know, they get thousands of followers, literally. It's like you go with the hashtag 100 days of practice or any, anything to do with that. And there's, there's people that can't play an instrument at all on there you know, playing through, or there's, there's people that are playing beautifully. And, but the number of, you know, just the right hashtag putting on there and consistency, that's the thing of putting out content consistently. It doesn't have to be anything amazing or profound. I think you'll get to that point as a good musician, you know, you'll hone it and do it, but it's just getting stuff out there. And for whatever reason, that's gaining followers now, like thousands and thousands of followers. So. Um, and it, it, you know, the trend of like professors now at different, you know, conservatories are doing that and, and, and um, but just, yeah, I, th I think, do it, what's your instrument? Trumpet. Yeah, I mean, literally. You go in there, you're like, put hashtag trumpet, hashtag 100 days challenge or something. Something about practicing, 100 days of practicing or just practice. And you'll see all, you know, it's crazy from all over the world. And just know when you see that, all of them are putting in those same hashtags and looking to see other content. So that's where you coming into play and tonight going home and literally playing like, you know, 20 seconds of something and then editing it and, you know, however you want um, and putting it out there and see what happens with, with, with hashtags. And then a week later, go back and take those hashtags off, put different ones and you'll see. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the whole thing of social media now of like changing hashtags, which they allow you to do and you get a whole new followers on there. Um, so that's where, like, you know what I mean? As an up and coming, I, I would totally, because whatever, wherever social media is going right now, this is, it's still kind of the beginning of what this is going to be. And, you know, Instagram right now is like staying, you know, so you want to have a lot of followers on there. And then, you know, yeah, and it helps with whether you're on tour or whether um, you want to sell a CD or, you know, any, anything you want to do. It's, it's kind of interesting. But it's kind of the Wild West right now. Yeah, and it's really, yeah, it's really interesting to me with classical musicians and, and jazz musicians what they're, what's gaining followers right now. But that's it, just put content on there. Yeah. Tonight, do it tonight. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, I'll look, I'll be watching. <laughs> we'll, we'll all go back and uh, practice and right, right, we'll, right. we'll tag you. Um, <laughs> any last thoughts of if you um, had to go back and do it again, is there any advice you would give to students about something you wish you'd done more in college or something that was really a um, piece of advice you'd like to leave us with? That's great. I, I, I mean, it's, it's so great being back in Michigan State because someone asked, when's the last time you were here? And I said, when I graduated. Like, I haven't been back since, so it's, it's great to be back here. I got so much from... Um, and I'm not just saying it because I'm here, because I say it wherever I lecture from, but my undergraduate, as opposed to my graduate school in New York City. Um, it was, I learned a lot. I made a community of friends that I still stay in touch with, a few of them that are all around the world. Um, the musicians that I'm friends with from the school, we you know, are still um, helping each other promote our own projects and seeing when we're in the, the same city, we're still seeing the things. Um, I think the biggest advice that I would say even more is to take advantage of 
what's here before you leave. You know, it's, it's stepping out into the real world is a huge change um, and a glorious change and, and when you, you know, figure out what you want to do and what you want to pursue. But there's so many resources here to take advantage of that once you step into that real world, you don't have as much. There's going to be, you know, there's the connection to alumni thing and, 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 and helping you out in that regard. But you have professors here, like, ask questions. Like, these kind of things go to even if it's not something in your wheelhouse or your genre. You know, if you're, not, if you're not into jazz music and you're not in the jazz program here, but there's some master of jazz coming in and doing a master class, like, go to it. Go to it, because like I said, you just observe and you learn from it. You, he might say something about moving to New York and a helpful hint that you know, is going to help you. It's not, you, can, you can use it in so many advantages. So I, so I did take advantage of that when I was here, but I would have done it much more. Um, with, the, with the theater school, I would have done more. I would have gone to more events over there of master classes that came in. I, I did one, and it was amazing. But I would have gone to more of visiting artists. Um, here are the visiting artists, I would have gone to more. Um, yeah, and just experience as much as you can here. Outside of that, you know, you have that, the tunnel vision of what dream, what career you want to do. But, but do everything on the periphery while you're here. Um, kind of ties into the diversity thing. Like, I'm a, big, I'm a big proponent of that, even if you're not going to go in that direction. But just take grains of wisdom from, from different visiting artists, from different master classes from different professors. Um, do as much as you can when you're here, because it's a great place. <laughs> well, I think that's a good place to end. Um, if you are interested in talking about um, breaking into a new city and obstacles and strategies, particularly with LA and New York, but other places too, tomorrow, 1240, um, upstairs in the conference room, and there will be free lunch if you tell me you're coming. So you should tell me you're coming. <laughs> um, if you have other questions, you wanted to ask something, but you felt intimidated by asking it in front of everyone, we'll stick around for a little bit. Please feel free to come up, say hi, um, make those connections, and let's thank Christian for spending an evening with us. Yeah.